Welcome to Birmingham Botanical Gardens. I'm Margaret Verdon and I volunteer with the Junior League of Birmingham. We are delighted to be a longtime partner with Friends of Birmingham Botanical Gardens for Can You Dig It? Today I'm seated here in the Carver Garden at Birmingham Botanical Gardens and I'm excited to read to you In the Garden with Dr. Carver, written by Susan Grigsby and illustrated by Nicole Tadgel. After our story time together, I invite you to come visit the garden in person. Birmingham Botanical Gardens is free and open to the public every day of the week. Enjoy. In the Garden with Dr. Carver by Susan Grigsby, pictures by Nicole Tadgel. To Perry with love, in memory of my grandfather, T.H. Boykin, who stirred in his daughter and granddaughters the love for making things grow. I'll never forget the Sunday that we stepped out of church and saw an old mule waiting beside a funny looking wagon. The man with the wagon was George Washington Carver, the famous plant scientist from the big school in Tuskegee. Dr. Carver called the wagon his movable school and it was piled high with plants, tools, and seeds. The adults all gathered around eager for advice. They had heard about the 20 pound cabbages and the onions as big as a young child's head that Dr. Carver had grown on land just like ours. He said that plants get from the soil the foods that they need to make to th make them grow. But cotton, like a hungry monster, had gobbled up all the good food in Alabama's soil. Dr. Carver was showing folks how to make our poor soil healthy again. He was even teaching people how to turn simple foods like peanuts and sweet potatoes into luxuries like coffee, butter, and sugar. Hundreds of new products poured out of our laboratory, all made from plants that we could grow. But for me, the best part of Dr. Carver's visit was that he agreed to stay through Monday to help us with the garden at our school. Who here would like to learn to be a plant doctor? Dr. Carver asked. I waved my hand the hardest so he could ask me to observe the first case. So Dr. Sally, he said, why do you think that the rose bush is looking so weak when her cousins by the fence are covered in beautiful red roses? I don't know, I admitted. What should I do first? Listen to the plants and they'll tell you what they need. Go on. I thought about what Dr. Carver meant. Maybe it was like listening to the wind and watching the sky to tell the weather. I looked over at the healthy roses basking in the bright sunshine. Then I examined my patient. Just one single rose grew on her entire bush as she sat all alone in the shade beside the shed. I've got it, I cried out. My patient needs to be moved to where she'll get more sunlight. That's an excellent job of observation, Dr. Sally, Dr. Carver said. Now let us begin the operation. Dr. Carver showed us how to transplant the rose bush very carefully without damaging her roots or letting her scratch us. When I was a boy, said Dr. Carver, drawing and plants were my two passions. I mixed my own paints and covered stones and discarded boards with pictures of flowers. I was always asking questions. I wanted to know the names of every strange stone and flower, every insect, bird, and beast that visited the garden. We wanted to know all about the garden too. So we just sat there, quiet, listening, watching to nature, and drawing the beetles and bees, flowers, fungi, worms, and birds, and pretty bits of stones. I never knew our garden was such a busy place, and Dr. Carver knew the name of everything. My brother Ben found a big web stretched out like a fishing net, spun of the finest lace. On it waited a huge and hungry spider. Ben raised a stick ready to kill it when Dr. Carver stopped him. That spider is helping your garden, explained Dr. Carver, by eating up the creatures that want to eat your plants. Before you change or destroy something, you need to understand why it exists and its relationship with the rest of nature. The plants, the soil, and the animals that visit are all connected just like a web. In every single flower bed, dandelions held up their sunny yellow heads. Who planted all these, Lucy asked. That would be old man Wynn, chuckled Dr. Carver. He showed us how the fluff of the dandelion puffball was really a family of hundreds of seeds. Carried by the wind, they could travel miles before landing and beginning to grow. A plant is a weed if it is growing uninvited, we learned. Those greedy dandelions were taking food, light, and water from the flowers that our teacher, Miss Simpson, had planted. Dr. Carver showed us how to remove the dandelions, pulling them up by their long and hungry roots. We saved their youngest leaves for our lunchtime salad. Dr. Carver said that we should eat all the fruits and vegetables that we could. By then, we were hungry as a pack of wild dandelions. 
Ms. Simpson and the older students had cooked a delicious spread of picnic food using recipes invented by Dr. Carver. After every bit was googled, gobbled up, they told us what we had eaten. Sweet potato flour bread, chicken made from peanuts, and salad of strange wild weeds. And for the dessert, peanut butter ice cream and cake. After our feast, Dr. Carver said that it was time to plant our own kitchen garden. We followed him to the lot behind our school. This spot is no good, Emmett said. It's sunny, but the soil's rock hard. See, it won't budge. He's right, I said. Nothing ever grows out here, not even weeds. And nothing ever will, unless we improve this worn out land, said Dr. Carver. Plants like people need nutrients, food, to help them grow. Dr. Carver took us to a patch of forest near our school. We scooped up buckets of rich and leafy loam. While we worked, he explained how rotting plants were full of good things to feed healthy plants. Leaf mulch, swamp muck, and the decaying roots of peanuts, peas, and beans will enrich the soil, he said. You can make your own fertilizer too. I'll leave Miss Simpson my recipe for compost. Paper shreds, vegetable scraps, anything that breaks down quickly will put nutrients back into the soil. So much of what people waste can be cut, put to good use. We cleared the plot of stones, spaded and hoed, chopped and raked, turning and mixing into the soil the forest hummus we had gathered. We worked that soil until we had fine, rich field. Then we divided it into plots. We planted sweet potato slips and peanuts, snap beans, lima beans, cow peas, squash, okra, and melons. Dr. Carver asked us to show him the nearest dump. We found wood scraps to use for our plant markers and raggedy head mop to make tall scarecrow. When Clarence grumbled about picking through the dump, Dr. Carver told us how he made test tubes, lamps, and all sorts of tools for his laboratory from the reused treasures of just such a dump. The word treasure set Clarence's eyes on fire. He kept picking until he found a fine costume for our shaggy headed scarecrow. Back at school, we used milk paint to label our garden signs so that we would remember what we had planted where. We were all sad to see Dr. Carver leave, but he made Mrs. Simpson promise to take us outdoors every day for a nature study and gardening lessons. And he gave her papers he had written to use as our school guides. And we promised Dr. Carver that we wouldn't eat wild weeds as some can be very poisonous until our teacher taught us which ones were safe. Some people come in and out of your life as quick as a hummingbird, darting at a trumpet vine. And some of them, when gone, leave something behind that sticks in your heart or mind. It sticks to you like a little burr on your sock. It wraps around you like the tendrils of a vine. Since that day, we spent in the garden with Dr. Carver. Whenever I step among flowers, trees, or vegetables, I remember his words. Listen to the plants and they'll tell you what they need. And they do. The end. Thank you so much for joining me here today in the Carver Garden at Birmingham Botanical Gardens. I look forward to seeing you here very soon.